Welcome everyone to another Parasite Experts Academy. My name is Camilo de Mendonça. I work at Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health and I'm responsible for the Ruminant Antiparasitics franchise. We hope uh, that you enjoy another session of, of our Academy Flashes. And before we introduce our guests here, um, Gustav will, will do that as usual. Um, I will um, go through some introduction of why we're here and what is this academy about. First of all, uh, we have an event chat box. So please write your questions in that chat box so we can capture them and, and, and ask them to our, to our guests. Please keep your microphone muted and your camera disconnected at all times so that we can have the best uh, um, user or, or viewer uh, experience as possible. And also in the end, we'll ask you some short feedback with a couple of questions um, towards the, how this question went for you or this event went for you. What is the, the Ruminant Parasite Expert Academy? And this webinars, we call them flashes. Well, the Ruminant Parasite Expert Academy was born a couple of years ago and um, it was, uh, meant to, to be able to, or to allow to learn or reflect, refresh the knowledge about most up-to-date topics in rumen parasitology from macro trends to, to more practical treatment and control solutions in, in, um, in parasitology. We had a first edition, presential, a face-to-face -face edition in, in 2019 in Germany, which was a success. This year, unfortunately for the constraints we all, we all know, we decided to replace it by, uh, by the series of, of webinars. We call it Flashes. Um, we wanna keep our Parasite Expert tra Academy training in spirit throughout these this condensed, um, condensed experiences. And uh, this webinar will take around 30 minutes, including questions. And uh, these, these webinars are running for since September and will go until February every two weeks. So we hope you enjoy, share our passion for ruminant parasitology, and uh, in the name of Beringer Ingelheim, again, we want to make parasite control simple and sustainable. So having said that, I give the floor to Gustavo Sabatini. Hello, everyone, and welcome, Gareth. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. So um, it's up to me to, to present Gareth. Uh, Dr. Gareth is... Dr. Gareth Kelly was introduced to veterinary parasitology at the University of Queensland in the late 90s. After being distracted from the field to complete his master's research degree on nutritional and genetic regulation of muscle development in cattle, he returned to the field to complete his PhD on the effect of gastrointestinal nematodes in Merino sheep and its implications for integrated parasite management. Gareth works for Beringer Ingelheim as a technical services manager in Australia and continues to be involved with trial work that focuses on improving parasite management on profitable farms and education of stakeholders in the supply chain. So Gareth, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gustavo, for that introduction. And um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about what we are doing um, with diagnostics and parasite control down here in Australia. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, so what I'll be talking for the next 20 minutes is talking about how we find value from diagnostics um, in Australia. And uh, just a brief outline of what um, I'll be covering. Um, I'm going to uh, firstly introduce you to the Boehringer Diagnostic Toolkit that we have available here in Australia. I'll then talk about some of the wins that we're having um, in the sheep production systems and where diagnostics fit in for parasite control in that area for us. And then I'll move on and look at how we're using diagnostics in cattle, um, both um, in beef cattle and also in dairy cattle, and then finish up with a few ideas on <clears throat> where we might be going into the future. All right, so on this slide here, we have um, a fine example of one of our sales managers, um, Wayne, who's based up in North Queensland. And Wayne, as a sales manager, one of his roles is getting on the farm and having um, technical conversations with producers and encouraging them to, to do best practices. 
In terms of the diagnostics that he has to support him in this, he has a, um, a, a budget of um, a number of individual Woe Med Count kits he can use. So here we have a, just a plastic tray that has 10 wells where you can have 10 individual samples to do a, to do a Woe Med Count. Um, we have what is quickly becoming our preferred Woe Med Count system of doing a bulk Woe Med Count. So that's simply collecting 20 to 30 um, fecal, fecal samples from 20 to 30 different animals. And we also have um, a new FEC pack uh, that our territory managers have. And this FEC pack is basically a mobile microscope. Um, I have one here with me. It's just a simple little unit um, that our sales managers can take on the road with them and take to our customers. And they simply put a fecal slurry into a little cartridge and insert that into the fake pack. And with the magic of the internet and the magic of this machine, they can have a pretty rapid worm med count returned to them. In addition to being able to do worm med counts, we also have um, ELISA kits that um, Svanova produces from Sweden, the Bavarian company. So we have ELISA kits for Ostatagia and for, for liver fluke. In addition to having these uh, diagnostic tools available to them. They also have a team of, of veterinary scientists and um, myself to help them interpret the diagnostic results that they get and also help them use the diagnostics in the best way possible. All right, just to give you some context of worm control, uh, a parasite control in Australia. Um, what we have in Australia is probably one of the world leading um, publicly funded uh, bodies that helps farmers get the best parasite control and, and educate farmers on what to do in their areas. And what, um, if you haven't already heard about Wormboss, I really encourage you to go and check the Wormboss website out. And you'll see that what they have done is divide Australia into eight, eight regions um, based on their geography and their production systems. And within each of these regions, we have what we call a drenched decision guide. And these drenched decision guides work farmers through a series of questions that helps them come to a conclusion about what they need to do for parasite control in their animals. And so it starts off by trying to find out what class of shit they are and whereabouts they are in the production system, because that is going to influence the type of treatments they will get and how, what the drench thresholds will be for those treatments. So every region has one of these drench decision guides. This is a copy of a, a hard copy one. But if they were to do it on the computer, it would take them through an interactive um, web module where they would get to their answer. So one of the critical components of worm control is obviously preventing worm infection, but we can't prevent worm infection all the time. And eventually, eventually we have to get to a point where we have to, to detect that infection. And to do that, we need to have a monitoring program. So what we have here on the image of a screen is um, a picture of just what goes on throughout the entire year. And there's some things that happen on farm that don't change from year to year. Things, that, things such as shearing, which happens pre-lambing. In this example, we have things like marking um, or tupping. And then we have the time of the year where we wean those animals. And that doesn't change each year. And what we suggest is that when we create these monitoring programs is that farmers do some diagnostic monitoring at these key events to help influence decisions. But we also suggest that when parasites um, have particular periods where they cause more risk, we suggest that they actually increase their monitoring frequency. So in this example here, uh, this is a farm that would have a barber's pile worm challenge over its warm um, and moist and warm and wet summer. So barber's pile worm challenge is going to be more of a challenge over these months. So we suggest when we have a barber's pile worm challenge, that's the time to increase your monitoring. So we've got farmers, they've tried to prevent infection. They've used diagnostics to monitor the infection, but how do they actually interpret the diagnostic results that they get? Well, what we've um, put together um, is, are these what drenched thresholds uh, based on a combination of science and also wisdom gained over many years of experience. And you can see um, for this region, when Barber's pile worm dominates uh, the fecal culture, we would suggest on average that the drench threshold would be about a thousand eggs per gram. When scale worms start to dominate the infection, we would reduce the drench threshold. 
And for sheep in an okay condition on okay quality pasture, uh, we would say drench, drench when that worm egg count gets above 500. One of the reasons why we have drench thresholds is that not only do they um, help get the timing of drenching right, but also really help manage refugia. And by, by ensuring that there's actually worms on pasture and cycling through the system without being exposed to a drench. Um, in the Australian context with our production systems and with our labour constraints and size of farms, drench thresholds are really the most um, appropriate way of managing refugia within our farming systems. So there are drench thresholds. Let's just look at an example of a farm over a couple of years and how the worm challenge changes over that time. So here we have a farm that um, we've got the worm med count over a two year period. And every time that worm med count gets to, uh, gets to zero, it means that those sheep have been drenched. So over two years on this farm, we've had sheep that have been drenched 10 times. And we can see at the start of observing that they were doing a pretty good job drenching around this 1,000 egg count threshold. But there came a particular time in the late summer, early autumn, when they, did, when they didn't get to drench at that threshold, but instead drenched much higher at a threshold at a count of around 2,000 eggs per gram. Well, the consequences of not drenching at this threshold meant that the worms became out of, out of control. And that's going to have significant consequences for the health of the sheep. We know, we know that when the worm egg count in sheep gets above 1,200 eggs per gram, the sheep are four times more likely to die than sheep that have a worm egg count below 1,200. So it's really important that we drench around that threshold mark of 1,000. All right, so I said that having a high worm egg count would have implications for the sheep health. And that's what we see um, when we do studies on farm. So on this slide here, we have the effect of worms on mortality um, over, over the length of the year. And this is multiple years combined. And what these black lines show are the is the mortality of sheep from worms on what we would call typical farms. Farms that don't use diagnostics or integrated parasite management principles such as grazing management. And you can see these farms that have what we call this typical approach to management actually end up losing quite a few sheep um, due to Barber's pole and due to these mortality events caused by worm infections. But the good news is, is that when we use diagnostics along with other integrated parasite, ma parasite management principles, as indicated by these dashed lines, we can see that we can reduce, we can, re we can remove the effect of Barber's pole worm by, re by removing the effect of mortality. And diagnostics have been really critical on farms to help maintain animal well-being. In areas where we have barber's pile worm challenge, doing regular worm meg counts is the most critical thing we can do to maintain the sheep welfare. Unfortunately though, while the relationship between worm meg count and barber's pile worm is quite strong and we're able to get good management of that worm through worm meg counts, it would be remiss of me not to mention that it is actually harder to get good control of non-barbers pile worms um, through worm egg counts. So our other worm species like Trichostrongulus and Teldesagia, um, it's pretty, pretty hard to define how much production loss we're getting based on worm egg counts alone. And that really is because we have a poor relationship between egg counts and worm burden. But egg counts also don't tell us um, the production loss that we're getting from the larval challenge that the parasites are causing and the immune response that the sheep or the cattle are mounting um, to, to those worm species. And unfortunately, when we look at uh, the effect of worm med count on weight gain um, across farm, it's really hard to see a strong relationship or any relationship at all. So while we might get relationships between worm med counts and single classes of sheep in animal houses or on single paddocks, when we look across multiple farms, across multiple times of the year, and we look at the average weight gain of sheep over 100 days compared to their worm med count, we really see that there's no relationship at all. And that really is a challenge for us that we haven't quite answered yet. So just to summarize uh, where we're getting value from diagnostics in sheep, 
What we're seeing is that diagnostics are increasingly used for drenched decision making, and they have a valuable role in maintaining animal welfare, improving productivity, uh, managing refugia, and, man and reducing the number of drenches that are used on farm. Boeringa in Australia, we continue to invest in these tools uh, to help demonstrate to farmers the value of diagnostics. So just this week, we did a diagnostic for a farmer, the worm egg count came back at over 5,000. And so we were able to then facilitate that farmer um, to be purchasing the right drench that manages both his worm problem there and near the sheep, but also the petting worm problem that he's gonna have in the future based on those high worm egg counts. The hope there is also that the farmer has now seen the value of diagnostics and that he'll be using the diagnostics himself, but keep coming back to the experts within Boringa to get advice on how to manage the parasites in his animals. But we do still need to find better tools to understand the challenge caused, by, caused to us by other worm species, including Teldesagia and Trichostrongulus. All right, so let's move on and um, have a look at how we're using diagnostics in um, cattle. I have to thank Abby Chase, who is a, a colleague of mine in New Zealand, um, who forwarded this quote uh, to me, um, which is over 50 years old. And it says, it may be time to consider the proposition that in cattle, fecal egg counts yield so little information as to cast serious doubt on their usefulness. And you know, 50 years later, it's really hard um, to add to that quote. Um, but one area that we are really trying hard um, to, to get value from worm egg counts in cattle is actually around the area of maintaining drench efficacy and using them in resistance management. So Ringer Ingelheim was the first company to launch a combination poron drench in Australia. And part of supporting the launch of this drench in the market is by equipping um, farmers to do drench checks and also scientists to do fecal egg count reduction tests. And what we have found across Australia is that we have widespread cuperia and homonchus resistance. So on this map here, each red dot represents where we have done a fecal egg count reduction test and found resistance, ML resistance, and each blue dot represents where we have done a drench check where we can indicate um, a strong, likely, strong likelihood that there will be ML resistance on those farms. One of the challenges we have with doing um, drench efficacy testing in cattle is making it simple and timely for the farmers involved. And while the WAVP might have um, great guidelines on determining drench efficacy, they're great um, if we want to register a new drench or something like that. But in terms of giving the farmer the information they need to make the best drenching decisions, we can actually put in methods that are much simpler and a much lower cost. And one of the ways we can lower cost is actually having simple lab methods or having tests that the farmers can do on farm. And so we need to kind of ask ourselves the question is, do the methods that we use to detect drench resistance really matter? And I think the answer is, you know, is, is almost a no. And um, Jane Nelson uh, has done a fantastic honours thesis um, through the Charles Sturt University um, here in Australia, where she compared um, the different, different egg counting methods and she's compared what I would call a gold standard uh, using the Flowtax system in, in two different laboratories. And she's compared the standard McMaster method. And she also um, used the new FECPAC, which I showed earlier. And if we just look here on farm three, we can see that no matter what lab method was used, all methods were able to detect resistance on the farm and therefore be able to influence what drenches that farmer used. And I think one thing that we need to remember is that we want farmers to use diagnostics is that simplicity is key. Uh, simplicity works and we also want quick results and lower cost, we want increased farmer adoption of diagnostics. So what about diagnostics on in dairy farms? So although GI nematode infections in adult cows are usually subclinical, they have been associated with decreased levels of milk production and fertility. A major problem, however, remains to identify herds where the infection level is high enough to, ju to justify an anthelmintic treatment. Egg counts are nearly always low, and even 
are always low or absent um, in adult cattle as their immune system is preventing worm meg production. Um, but the worm, the immune response system is still costing energy, uh, protein, and in turn, milk production. And that impacts on profitability. When we look at a couple of Australian studies that have shown a positive response to treatment, we can see that there's really no diagnostic that indicates that treatment would have been required. And so in this study here that showed a 74, lit 74 litre response to, to treatment over 100 days, the way meg counts or, or effects were very low, ranging from 1 to 14. In a subsequent follow-up study, again, that showed a significant result to treatment, less than less than 50% of the cows actually had a positive worm meg count greater than zero. Well, fortunately, uh, we do have a different test in dairy cattle, and that is the Ossetagia antibody ELISA test, which detects um, the immune response that cows are producing to that challenge. And we can, we can test that by taking a bulk milk sample from the vat. Now in Northern Hemisphere, the results from this test have been really well correlated to an estimated effect on milk yield. So we measure the antibody response in optical density ratio units, and we can look at the value of the test result and then see what the effect is on the milk yield. The test has even, been, has even shown us relationships between the antibody response and uh, conception and fertility rates in dairy cattle. But one of the challenges we have in Australia is that our dairy cows spend their entire time grazing. And as animals spend more time grazing, the antibody response that we measure is increased. And so we can see on this graph here is that when we can find animals and we have a very low parasite challenge or absent a parasite challenge, we have a very low antibody response. But as animals increase their grazing time to from semi-confined in the green area to being fully grazing here in the Australian system, we see the antibody response increase. And unfortunately, when we use this test in Australia, nearly all the time the answer comes back and tells us that we should be drenching our dairy cattle. And that is not a sustainable practice. What we wanted to do is better understand the internal parasite challenge facing our dairy herd here in Australia, and to determine if the ELISA diagnostic tool actually had a role for management of internal parasites. So in Australia, we've been using this as a cell support tool since 2006. And we, over time, have collected over two and a half samples. So we have a really good, nice data set. And we're able to match the samples that we've collected to different geographic regions within Australia. So in Australia, our dairy herd is split into different regions. And so we have part of our dairy herd uh, located in subtropical areas where we know that we have a low Ossetagia challenge. And in Southern Australia, where we have most of our dairy production, we know that in these areas, we have greater Ossetagia challenge. And when we look at our results, the first thing we can see is that our, our antibody responses in our subtropical environments are much lower. But when we look at our responses in our winter rainfall climates, where we know we have a high worm challenge, these results are much higher. So what we've been able to do is actually validate the test to show that the test in Australia still gives us a good indication of worm challenge. What we have done then, what we've done next is then look at the distribution of antibody responses across those herds in Australia and broken them into quartiles. And so what we're now saying is that for the 25% the of farms that have the lowest antibody response, we're now saying that these animals no, don't need, don't need uh, treatment because they're not likely to have, be having any economical production loss. Next, next quarter, our advice is now to maintain the current worm contro control practices. On these farms, they obviously have something working for them that controls the worm challenge. And we're saying maintain those practices. But for the rest of the farms, the top 50% or the 50% of farms that have the high worm challenge, we're now saying that these farms are more likely to be benefiting from a treatment. So for the next quarter, we're saying that an economic benefit is likely 
due to the treatment. And then for the fourth quartile or the bottom 25, bottom 25 percent of farms, uh, we're obviously saying that production loss is most likely and that these animals should be treated. And by adjusting um, our thresholds on this data, we've actually been able to reduce uh, the number of animals that have been treated and actually improve parasite management and in product stewardship, um, particularly in the face of ML resistance developing in Australia. So let me just summarise by showing how we have found value from diagnostics in Australia. So diagnostics have improved anthelmintic management. We both have better time drenches, we're able to maintain refugia, um, monitor drench efficacy, and reduce the number of treatments. We can also reduce mortality uh, by using diagnostics, um, and so therefore improving animal well-being. And finally, uh, we're able to, by using diagnostics, while they might cost money, we're able to demonstrate that they're an investment the farmer can make because they improve productivity on the farm. But we must continue to demonstrate the reward uh, that diagnostics provide versus the effort it takes to collect them. I think the other benefit that Boehringer gets by investing in diagnostics is that not only do we get the intangible benefits of um, product stewardship and technical leadership, but we also um, use diagnostics to take our customers along their journey um, to drench purchase and better drench management. So where to next with diagnostics? Well, in Australia, there's still a significant opportunity for greater adoption. That's a probably a polite way of saying that there's still a lot of farmers out there who aren't using diagnostics at all, and they're missing out on the potential benefits that diagnostics can provide them. The other thing is that there's definitely a role for bad diagnostics in our systems. Diagnostics need to be convenient and timely. At the moment, uh, farmers have to think about taking a diagnostic sample about two weeks before they bring the animals into the yard. And unfortunately, there's many farmers who still go to the effort of bringing animals into the yard. And because of that effort required, go, I may as well give them a cheap drench while they're here. Um, if we're able to have systems that can tell farmers they need to drench animals when, they, when they're in the yards in a timely manner, that'd be fantastic. Um, I think the other thing with diagnostics, I think, we know that parasites cause a reduction in feed intake and in, in activity of the animals. I think technology is getting to a point now that where we can have accelerometers in ear tags and we can measure animal activity and we can use, uh, I think, real-time alerts to let farmers know that when, when their animals are starting to spend less time grazing or less time moving, and therefore that's likely that a drench will be required. I think the other thing that our diagnostics, they need to make um, to be evidence-based and that farmers need to be able to, um, to be, yeah, have actionable advice based on the diagnostics results that they're getting. So look, I, I hope you've been encouraged by how we can use diagnostics here in Australia to gain value and better parasite control. And I hope you've been stimulated to think about how you might be able to use diagnostics in your own country um, to, to get those results as well. So Gustavo and Camilla, thank you. And um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gareth. Thanks. Thanks, um, very interesting presentation. Oh, we, we have a couple of questions in the chat box and, and Camilo is going to...